Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my really proud privilege to welcome you all to this first uh, webinar, quarterly webinar of the Kolkata Regional Chapter of uh, Society of Fetal Medicine India. Uh, this time, uh, we have kept the topic as growth because we really thought that it should be a con combination of uh, gynecologists, radiologists, obstetricians, uh, all put together and the common interest topic would be growth. That's why all of us decided that the topic should be growth. And we are very happy to announce that we have been supported by the Bengal Obstetrics and Gynecological Society and the president of Bengal Obs and Gynecology Society, Dibbendu, Dr. Dibbendu Banerjee is here. Hi, Dibbendu. And we also have the president of the IRIA, Eastern Zone, Dr. Pratap Saha. Is he here? I can't yes, see yes. him. Uh, okay, he'll, yeah, right, okay. Hello, hi. hi. Now, now uh, we have been joined by Dr. TLN Parveen, who is the, who is the current president of the Society of Fetal Medicine India, and of course, Dr. Kashok Kurana, who is the immediate trust president. Uh, with this, I would like to, without taking in much time, and of course, uh, Professor Asma Khalil, I forgot. <laughs> you joined just now as one of our star guests, orators of today evening, and she'll st start the ball rolling. And after that, there would be a panel discussion following what she says. And we have guest panelists and moderators, and we have expert opinions and the panelists as usual. And I hope the delegates also join in uh, with through the question and answer and to the chat box because there would be lots of questions which needs to be answered. And with that, without wasting much of time, I would leave the floor to Dr. TLN Praveen to ca carry this forward. Dr. Okay. Praveen, please. Good evening, everybody, and uh, hope uh, all of you are doing well and staying safe. And uh, on behalf of uh, SFM, it's really a proud moment for us to have Asma Khalil with us, uh, who is going to talk to us on uh, growth, who is an authority in the world. And uh, before we start off giving it, uh, give, uh, holding, uh, handing it over to her, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Benerji, who is the president of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology Society of uh, Calcutta, as well as uh, Pratap Chandra Saha, who is the president of IRIA, to be the floor moderators. Over to you, Dr. Pratap Saha, as well as Benerji. Hello. Hello, good evening, everybody. Hello, Dr. Parvin. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Kurana, good evening. Very good evening and thank you so much for your support here. Thank you very much. It's so nice to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I think we can start off with the proceedings. Yeah. Yeah. So, now, Dr. Shah, I'd request Dr. Pratap Chandra Shah to introduce our speaker for the evening. Dr. Shah. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very much grateful to SFM and Boggs for uh, chair, um, chairing this occasion. And now, uh, today, our guest lecturer, Professor Ashma Khalil, will speak on Diagnosis, Surveillance, and Delivery Decision in Fetal Growth Restriction. Professor Ashma Khulil is a professor of obstetrics and maternal fetal medicine at St. George's University Hospital, University of London. Asma gained her MD at University of London in 2009, following two years research into preeclampsia. She also has a master's degree in epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and an MRC scholarship. She has published more than 45 peer-reviewed research papers in medical journals, many review articles and book chapters. Her special interests remain in fetal medicine, high-risk obstetrics, and multiple pregnancy. She is currently admired all over the world as a great researcher who believes in rapidly translating research into clinical practice and give each fetus an optimal outcome which fits exactly with the equals of society of fetal medicine. So, uh, I am inviting Professor Rashma Khalil to carry on her uh, speak. 
I will thank you very much uh, for your kind uh, introduction. And it's real pleasure to to be um, here. Well, here is online with you. And thank you, Ashley, for inviting me. It's such a privilege to be with you. And I'm sorry that we are not able to be physically together, but at least we have the internet and we can be online together. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about fetal uh, growth restriction and share with you some of the new um, research and management. And I'm going to sort of cover both like really the basics. So for the people online who maybe st still at the early stage in, in their career or they're not necessarily sort of very specialist in fetal medicine, but also cover more advanced things, particularly how to monitor and, and how what the ideal time to, um, to deliver. I think you can see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So I think it's, it's important to know or to understand what are the important outcomes for the various people involved in the management of fetal restriction. So for us as obstetricians, obviously we are concerned about the risk of hypoxia and acidosis and ultimately the risk of stillbirth. That's what we really sort of try to prevent. And for the neonatologist, well, it's more about neonatal mortality and morbidity. And we need to understand that the neonatal morbidity is um, heavily associated, very closely associated with obviously prematurity. But in fetal growth restriction, it's not just prematurity, but the fetal growth restriction itself, per se, is associated with also morbidity. But actually, ultimately, the most important people in this, um, in, in this dilemma is the parents. And the parents, what they want really is a normal child. And therefore, it's a, it's a tricky for us because as, as clinicians, what we really want to try to achieve is a normal child for these parents. And um, what about stillbirths? Our fetal association as a cause of stillbirths. There's a number of different classifications for stillbirths. Um, and certainly for many years, um, we would argue, or the data suggests that two thirds of stillbirths are unexplained, or you don't find the cause. But certainly the new classifications um, and the new um, diagnostic criteria for fetal growth restriction or better understanding of fetal growth restriction is nearly half of stillbirth cases are due to or related to growth restriction. Um, the question really so does it matter if I identify fetal growth restriction, can I reduce the risk of stillbirth? And is there is data to support that? Well, this is data from the UK, from uh, publishing BMJ a few years back, where I actually um, looked at the stillbirth and fetal growth restriction. And I'm going to show you here. So this is all these pregnancies, but a large number of pregnancies. The stillbirth is about, let's say, 5%. If you look at the pregnancies that did not have fetal growth restriction compared to the one that had fetal growth restriction, of course, stillbirth is increased to about 17, 18% in the pregnancies that had fetal growth restriction. But if the fetal growth restriction was detected antenatally, uh, the risk of stillbirth was obviously significantly lower compared to if the fetal growth restriction was not detected. And therefore, really the conclusion is that identification or prenatal or antenatal identification of fetal growth restriction is likely to reduce the risk of um, stillbirth. And the, the other issue that we need to understand is the difference between fetal growth restriction and small for gestational age. Well, small for gestational age traditionally defined as birth weight less than 10 centile. But fetal growth restriction is not necessarily the same as still a small for gestational age. And some small for gestational age have fetal growth restriction, but also some fetal growth restriction are not necessarily less than uh, birth weight less than 10 centiles. Some of them might have birth weight above the 10 centiles. So they're not exactly the same. And the problem, I think, or that one of the other dilemmas in the management of, of pregnancies is that actually how to identify fetal growth restriction. And over the years, people <clears throat> chose different things or used different things, which made it bit difficult to compare the studies. But this consensus definition was published about four years ago now, and certainly it's very popular among the new studies. So a lot of the new studies that are being submitted to journals or being published, certainly there is one guideline on fetal construction that's published earlier this year, have adopted this definition of fetal construction. And this definition would define it either early or late, early fetal construction before 32 weeks, and the diagnostic criteria is either abdominal circumference or estimated fetal weight less than third centile. 
or uh, abnormal umbilical artery Doppler, so absent in, uh, in the solid flow in the umbilical artery. But if you want to use a conventional cutoff of 10 centile, in this case, you need to have, in addition, you need to have umbilical artery or uterine artery PI pulsatility index above the 95th centile. So you need to have abnormal fetal uterine do uh, Dopplers. What about late fetal ghost restriction? So again, similar. So abnormal circumference or so small fetal weight less than third, not tenth. If you're going to use a tenth, you need something else. You need to contribute a parameter, which is either dropping the centiles by more than two quarters. So it means a drop by more than 50 centiles. So for example, the baby was in the 70th centile and became on the 20th centile. Or CPR or cerebroplacental ratio less than fifth centile. And I'm gonna to talk to you later in more details about the CPR. And this table again is included in the ISWA guideline on fetal ghost restriction. And it's a comparison between early onset and late onset um, fetal ghost restriction. And as I said, the main clinical challenge in early onset fetal ghost restriction is to, to, to manage it and to determine the ideal timing of delivery. When should I deliver this um, baby? Because it's always a balance, a delicate balance between the risk of stillbirth, if you just carry on with the pregnancy, but also the risk of neonatal mortality and morbidity and secondary to prematurity if you deliver um, very early. For the late onset fetal ghost restriction is actually how to identify the pregnancy is complicated by fetal ghost restriction because um, it's, it's difficult, not just, as I mentioned, not all SGA are fetal ghost restriction. And we know that the ultrasound scan is not very accurate in estimating, uh, estimating uh, baby size near term. The prevalence about a third of all pregnancies with fetal ghost restriction are actually early onset, early onset, 70% are late onset. So the majority of fetal ghost restriction occur as late onset, two, more than two thirds. As I mentioned, the cutoff is 32 weeks between early and late. In the early, the baby tend to be very small and the late tend to be small, but not very small. And the Dopplers, um, often the umbilical artery Doppler is abnormal in early onset fetal constriction. Often you see also redistribution, but and then you monitor for the abnormalities in the ductus venosus Doppler. For the late onset fetal constriction, often the umbilical artery Doppler is normal or at least um, the positive endosolic flow. Um, but what you see is redistribution, cerebral distribution, so cerebral vasodilatation, so um, changes in the cerebral um, circulation. The biophysical profile may be abnormal in either of them, so that doesn't really help. Um, about 50% of early onset fetal ghost restriction also have preeclampsia or have hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, while in late onset fetal restriction, that's not uh, very frequent, it's not very common association. And um, for early onset, you would see the typical signs of impaired placentation and um, impaired trophoblast infection, spiral artery abnormalities, while actually in late, you will find maybe altered diffusion. So you don't necessarily have the typical signs of impaired trophoblastic invasion. The early onset have associated with high risk of perinatal mortality and risk of stillbirth, while the late onset fetal ghost restriction is relatively low. And certainly also when the studies uh, looked at the cardiovascular profile of the mothers, they found also some changes or differences between early onset and late onset. So early onset have low cardiac output and high peripheral resistance, while actually the late onset fetal constriction don't necessarily have um, late uh, have low cardiac output, for example, in the mother. Obviously, the obvious question: Can we prevent it from happening in the first place? And obviously, the big layer is a low dose aspirin, and um, this meta analysis by Bujold. Um, looked at the um, effect of giving aspirin according to the gestation age. So if you give aspirin um, after 16 weeks, there was no difference. So this is a, a relative risk of 0 0.98. It crosses the line of one of no effect, there's no difference. But if you, in the studies that give aspirin early before 16 weeks, so I did in the first trimester, they found that actually that reduces uh, fetal growth restriction by um, more than 50%. So you have the relative risk of 0 0.44, that means reduction by more than 50%, so, which is obviously great. But when we did the randomized control trial, so you, I'm sure you're all familiar with the ASPRI trial, which was giving low-dose aspirin 
mainly to prevent preeclampsia. It was a multi-center study. This was a, the design, so that giving 150 milligram per day of aspirin to, from 12 weeks until 36 weeks. But this was giving it to women who had first trimester screening using the Free the Medicine Foundation algorithm, and they were found to be at high risk of preeclampsia. And I said the outcome was mainly preeclampsia. This was not a trial for this fetagosuction in the first place. The trial was very positive. So it showed that actually giving low dose aspirin 150 milligram um, per day to women uh, at high risk of preeclampsia reduces the risk of preeclampsia, massive reduction. So an early onset preeclampsia is in 34 weeks, about 80% reduction in um, uh, return preeclampsia, 60% reduction but there was no effect on small for gestational age or stillbirths. So when you look at the, um, the difference in birth weight less than 10 percentile, there was no difference. Can we screen for fetal growth restriction? And certainly there are a number of studies that try to do that, whether in the first trimester, second or third trimester. So if you uh, use the Fetal Medicine Foundation algorithm that I showed you earlier, the one that was mainly for preeclampsia, and try to identify small babies without preeclampsia, so just the small babies. And this algorithm combines the known maternal risk factors, so the height and weight, the racial, uh, the ethnic background, the parity, the, having a history of small baby before, having a history of chronic hypertension, or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or systemic lupus, or smoking, and combining it with youth maternal HRT Doppler and the maternal blood pressure and um, placental growth factor and PEP-A, and you do that in the first trimester, and you see what's the detection rate, and the detection rate for babies, small babies, less than 34 weeks was about 75%, while actually for term, small for gestation age was only about 50%. I think it's important, and very important to understand that. So this large screening studies, including this one, the outcome was birth weight less than 10 centile. And remember, I told you that birth weight less than 10 centile does not equate fetal restriction. Birth weight less than 10 centile means small fish station age. And we know that 70% of them are actually normal and have good outcome. And therefore, it, it's, the performance is not great for a small fish station age. But I think the one important problem is the outcome is not really fetal growth restriction, the outcome with small fish station age. I suspect if the outcome is fetal growth restriction, the performance will be much better. Um, so, and therefore, we will try to see whether actually we can look at fetal restriction. And you remember I told you that if you use the, the third centile instead of the 10th centile, you're more likely to identify gross restriction. Because you remember I showed you the consensus um, diagnostic criteria. So if you see here, and looking at the combination of uterine orthodoppler with the fetal biometry using the femur lens and the abdominal circumference. And if you see here, the detection rate is, false positive rate is like 10%. And if the outcome is small fish station age less than 10 centile, less than 32 weeks, you see it's early onset, so it's likely more likely to be fetal constriction. So the detection rate is better, you know, 70% if you use a triangle doppler and 80% if you combine a triangle doppler with the biometry. If you use less than third centile, less than 32 weeks, that's an early onset fetal growth restriction. You see the triangle doppler picking up 80% for 10% false positive rate. And if you combine it with the fetal biometry, female lens and abdominal circumference, it's about 90%. And therefore, you have to be careful when you look at the screening studies. You try to double and fetal biometry are good parameters to identify the pregnancies complicated by fetal restriction, but not very good um, for just small fish station age, particularly at term. The best really um, probably combination or algorithm and uh, with the one that uh, combined maternal risk factors for fetal growth restriction plus um, the triangle doppler uh, plus the fetal biometry. So that's the red, all of them, or combination. And again, the, the outcome as you see, so it's more, less than fifth centile, less than 32 weeks, less than fifth centile between 32 and 36 weeks, less than fifth, a term, 37 weeks. And therefore, this is the most severe end of the spectrum. And therefore, the detection rate is 90% for 10% false positive rate using the combination. So I think it is possible to, identi to, to screen, um, identify pregnancies at, at risk of uh, fetal growth restriction if we 
choose the right outcome. So feed across restriction rather than small fish station age. And we need to use a combination of parameters rather than single parameter. The next part of my talk is really sort of back to basics. So what should I do is that if I'm a clinician, or if I'm an obstetrician or feed a medicine doctor, and I scan someone, I scan a baby and I find it small. We need to identify that 70, we need to realize that 75% of them are normal. Only 20% of them are actually small because of a secondary to uh, impaired placentation or placenta insufficiency. And about 5% of them actually have abnormalities in form of structural abnormalities, chromosomal abnormalities, genetic syndromes, congenital infection. And of course, one purpose of the ultrasound scan in this case is to rule out these babies that have abnormalities and also to look for the identify the fetuses of cross restriction and to avoid unnecessary intervention in actually normal small fetuses. That's your role as obstetrician or fetal medicine specialist. And, and therefore, it's really important, especially if you haven't seen this woman from early uh, stage in pregnancy, from the first trimester, ideally. So in the UK, we date the pregnancies according to the crown rump lens in the first trimester. And therefore, always check how is that date, how, uh, how is the pregnancy dated and how accurate is that? And the other thing, of course, you're going to do the pyometry. We measure the head circumference, abdominal circumference, and the female lens. And there are different equations to calculate the estimated fetal weight. And certainly one of the best, if not the best equation, is Hadlock. And certainly we compared all the equation that's been published, and we found that the most accurate is Hadlock. And then obviously once you do the estimated fetal weight, you need to plot it on a chart. And there is a number of charts, whether customized, whether the WHO, whether the intercross. There are several charts. I'm not going to go through them because there's a whole talk uh, on its own and it's a very controversial uh, topic. The second thing is obviously to look and to do a detailed anatomy scan because you want to look for abnormalities, for example, and identify signs of fetal infection. So, for example, if you have echogenic bowel, if you have intracranial uh, calcification or um, abdominal or liver calcifications, in this case, you need to think of potential congenital infection as an explanation for the smallness um, and something like CMV, for example. And um, the other thing is aneuploidy or consider doing amniocentesis or uh, prenatal uh, testing or invasive uh, testing to rule out um, aneuploidy, such as trisomy 18, for example, as a cause of small baby. And the typical ultrasound features that you see in this case, of course, is ventricular megaly. You see here the lemon-shaped um, head, the spina bifida, you see the effect in the spine, you see the choroid plexus, you see the talibus, you see the small exomphalus. These are all typical uh, ultrasound features that make you suspicious of transmunity. Another thing that you need to look at the ultrasound scan is amniotic fluid volume, because certainly small um, for gestational age babies who are likely to be normal, they tend to have normal amniotic fluid, uh, contrary to, for example, if you have uh, oligohydramnias, uh, which is more likely a suggestive of placenta insufficiency, and on the opposite, if you have polyhydramnias and small baby, actually this is really concerning and think of potential um, genetic syndromes or aneuploidy or abnormalities to explain the polyhydramnias. Um, so you try to Doppler, you need to be able to know the technique of doing try and Doppler and also identify the normal uh, waveform from the abnormal. So if this is a normal, you have good diastolic flow, and this is abnormal when you have um, placenta insufficiency when you have um, uh, raised pulse fertility index, and sometimes you see this um, diastolic notch. What about the umbilical artery Doppler? So this is all things that you need to do when you do the ultrasound scan. When you face a baby, you measured it, small, you look for the amniotic fluid, you do detailed anomaly scan, you consider or exclude in congenital infections, and then you do your artery Doppler, and then you do fetal Dopplers. The fetal doubler, the umbilical artery doubler, this is how uh, the normal appearance, so uh, so uh, see so. And you see that this uh, ideally, when you do the doubler, the umbilical um, artery, you can, in the same uh, picture, you can see the artery and the vein uh, underneath. And then when you have a uh, case where you have hypoxia, you start seeing the um, increased resistance, and therefore there's a high positivity index and you lose some of this diastolic flow, so it's much less. And then when it gets worse, you have absent in the diastolic flow. And when it, you have acidosis, so it's even getting worse, you have reverse in the diastolic flow in the umbilical artery. And here we can see pulsation. So the umbilical vein 
choose non-pulsatile flow, you can start here seeing pulsations in the umbilical vein. What about the middle sever artery? When I, I told you before about redistribution, so fetus who have ghostrestriction or hypoxia, they, um, they redistribute, so they will vasodilate to the cerebral circulation, um, and therefore you see that. So this is a, a normal um, middle sever artery uh, uh, flow uh, waveform. And this is when you have hypoxia and you have actually a low pulsatility index because of reduced resistance, so increased flow, essentially. And then the last um, Doppler uh, or blood vessels that you need to be able to, um, to look at is the ductus venosus. And you see here, you identified by the color because it's aliasing, because it's increased velocity here, ductus venosus. This is how it looks as normal flow with a positive A wave. And then this is when you have hypoxia, you start having absent, the sorry, absent A wave. And then when it's, uh, you have even worse acidosis when you have reverse A wave in the ductus venosus Doppler. So what you do, this is what happens when I see uh, a, or a, a woman is referred to me with a small for gestational age. I need to rule out that there was wrong dates. So it goes through how the pregnancy was dated. And I need to uh, see whether actually it's a normal, uh, small normal baby. So in order to do that, you need to have no abnormalities, you need to have normal amniotic fluid, the baby is active and moving, and you also need to have Doppler, normal Doppler, uterine Doppler, umbilical artery, middle sleep artery, ductus venosus. If all of this, you tend to be reassuring and just follow up the pregnancy. Uh, what about uh, babies who are starved, small, so that's a placental insufficiency, so in this case, you, there will be no abnormalities. You might have reduced amniotic fluid, all of the Sometimes the baby is not uh, very active. Um, sometimes you might have asymmetric growth, so the uh, abdominal circumference is smaller than the um, head circumference, for example, or a reduction in the gross velocity. In this case, sometimes you will have abnormal uh, uterine Doppler, so increased pulsatility index. Again, abnormal umbilical artery increased pulsatility index. Often you will have reduced pulsatility index in the middle cerebral artery, and the ductus venosus Doppler might be abnormal in severe cases. Well, but abnormal small, in this case, you will find abnormalities. So uh, abnormalities are that, that when I showed you before, structure abnormalities, for example, or markers of aneuploidy or of infection. Um, and sometimes there will be variation in amniotic fluids. You might have it normal, you might have it polyhydramnus, you might have oligohydramnus. The baby might be active, but also could be not moving at all because maybe you have abnormality or a genetic syndrome or something. And the, um, the fetal dopplers and the uterine dopplers, the uterine dopplers is often normal, but the fetal dopplers can change, can vary. Um, and therefore, I think it's once you think it is actually a fetal cost restriction, so it's a small baby because of placental insufficiency or impaired placentation, and you are considering or determining or monitoring and deciding when you should deliver, you should consider obviously of the, the survival and more importantly, the intact survival. And the, you see in this graph on the left-hand side, the survival is the red. But this is not what you really want to. You, what you want is intact survival. If you remember, I told you what the parents want is a normal child. Um, and again, on the right-hand side, just show you what I told you before, the early onset less than 32 weeks, the challenge is obviously what we want to do, the research is protection and prevention, while after 32 weeks, the late onset is detecting when is the ideal time to deliver. Um, so in fetal cost restriction or early fetal restriction, that's your usual pattern of deterioration of the Dopplers. So the umbilical anti Doppler, you start having high resistance, you lose the endastolic flow, and then after the end, endastolic flow, and then reverse endastolic flow, the middle sub artery is opposite, you will have uh, low resistance or low PI, and the ductus venosus, like what I showed you before, as it gets worse, you'll have absent A wave and then reverse A wave. And um, near the end, you obviously have oligohydramnias and Finally, you will have abnormal CTG or ideally computerized CTG, and then loss of movement and um, fetal death or stillbirth. For the late fetal cost restriction, um, that's uh, again the evolution is that the umbilical artery Doppler, yes, you can have high resistance, but actually often the endosolic flow is still positive. The middle cerebral artery is the one that you're more likely to see the changes with actually reduced um, uh, PI because reduction in the resistance. And then after that, you will have the abnormalities in the CTG. 
And therefore, you notice that you're not going to find the ductus venosus abnormalities in the late onset fetal constriction, for example. So the, the, the evolution and the progression is different. Um, I think it's important to know the threshold for delivery. So certainly before 28 weeks, or uh, with, if the estimated fetal weight is less than 600 gram, really we are very reluctant and we're trying our best not to deliver um, because we want to gain maturity and therefore our threshold to deliver is high is when you have reverse a wave in the ductus venosus or abnormal computer ICTG. Between 28 and 32 weeks, well, um, you know, this baby's the survival is, is actually much better. And therefore, um, our threshold to uh, deliver would be less. And our aim is to avoid stillbirth in this uh, group. So again, just to summarize the signs of deterioration, the early onset, I said that yes, they have redistribution, but actually that does not influence uh, the timing of delivery or the threshold of delivery. What we'll be looking at is the changes in the umbilical artery doppler, absent reverse in those flow, and the ductus venosus, a wave, and the computerized CG. Late onset fetal constriction is often the umbilical artery doppler is not, so there's no absent or reverse in the solid flow, but the MCA, oligodendromous, and abnormal CG. And just to show you that some of the early onset fetal constriction, this is 32 weeks, we end up by delivering them, not, not necessarily because of deterioration of the Dopplers, but because about half of them, 50% of them develop preeclampsia, and sometimes we deliver for maternal indication rather than fetal indication. So when is it ideal time to deliver? Well, that's what we tend to do. That's the general um, consensus is that um, if you have, if it, the gestation is 32 weeks or higher, we deliver if we have absent, uh, sorry, reverse endostolic flow in the umbilical artery. It's after 34 weeks will be the absent endostolic flow in the umbilical artery. And at 37 weeks or, or later, we will deliver even if the small baby, because we have the evidence from the habitat trial that's actually safe um, to deliver um, at 37 weeks. Having said that, recently, I think if you have a small vegetation age with normal Doppler, so not necessarily fetal constriction, you could obviously continue carrying on after 37 weeks with close monitoring. Um, so the, one of the, well, several, some of the studies that try to address um, how, how what's the ideal way of monitoring or the threshold to delivery with a truffle trial. The truffle is a multi-center and a mice control trial. And this was a protocol so the truffle trial focus really on um, just, yeah, focus on early onset fetal restriction between 26 and 32 weeks um, with abnormal umbilical artery doppler. Um, so the PI is raised, but normal ductus venosus doppler and the computerized CTG. So this was a threshold to deliver. So if you have between 26 and 29 weeks, the threshold with short-term variation of 2.6 or more, 29 to 32 weeks, short-term variation above uh, three. And therefore, that was the inclusion criteria. So if it was less, it was not included. So you had to have normal computer on CTG uh, before actually when it's included. And this was a threshold to deliver. So if you have um, late ductus stenosis changes, so we have reverse, for example, A wave or absent A wave, and this was a computer on CTG threshold, so 26 to 29 weeks, if the short-term variation is less than 2.6, and 29, 32 weeks with three. Or obviously if you have um, unprovoked recurrent uh, decelerations. What the, um, the truffle trial concluded or showed two things. Number one is actually the outcome of this pregnancies was better than was expected. So in fact, the stillbirth rate in these pregnancies was lower than uh, what they initially anticipated. So the outcome was not that bad. And the other thing is that if you um, deliver based on the ductus venosus doppler or the computerized CTG, that will be the ideal threshold or ideal monitoring protocols for these pregnancies. The outcome for this trial was actually the developmental outcome at the age of two, and certainly the doctor's venosis and Doppler was better. Do we have any therapy or any treatment to improve uh, fetal constriction? And this was addressed in the, um, the, the Strider trial, which we were part of the UK Strider. There are a number of different Strider 
trials all over the world. So there's one in Canada, there's one in New Zealand, there's one in Ireland, in UK, and so on. And uh, we, uh, with multi-center trial in the UK, we took part in the Strider, and that was randomized control trials of Viagra, of sildenafil, in pregnancies with severe early onset fetal restriction. So they were even more severe than the truffle. The truffle looked at this foot ego restriction between 26 and 20 and 32 weeks. Uh, while actually the strider even looked at the really the one that have dismal prognosis, a very early onset severe fetal restriction was randomized with double um, uh, placebo controlled double blind. Uh, of Viagra, giving Viagra. Why? Why actually? What made us look at that? Because in fact, sildenafil or Viagra is vasodilator, is a strong vasodilator, is through the effect of nitric oxide. And um, in, uh, there was at that time observational data to show that actually increases birth weight, increases the baby's weight in pregnancies complicated by uh, fetal restriction. And that's why there was a rationale behind the trial. We finished the trial, it's published in uh, Lancet a few years ago, and the trial was negative. There was no effect. So there was no difference in live births or stillbirths or neonatal deaths or the interval between randomization and delivery, as you can see in this figure. And therefore, based on that, there is no indication to give Viagra or Sildenafil in pregnancies with fetal uh, cross restriction. Not just that, but in fact, the Dutch uh, uh, Strider trial who stopped early because of excess neonatal deaths or excess mortality in the in sildenafil arm, and therefore the trial they had eleven babies died and the, the trial had to be stopped for safety. And it's not just there's no actually sildenafil does not benefit. If anything, it might actually harm, and therefore we should not give Viagra to these pregnancies. And then I'm going to spend the next sort of part of my talk really questioning the concept of relying on the fetal size alone to identify fetuses that have cross restriction or being uh, at risk, for example, and show you some of the data about the accuracy of the estimated fetal weight in predicting adverse outcomes. This is our data, large number of pregnancies, 22 and a half thousand pregnancies um, at term, so beyond 36 weeks. And when you look at the estimated fetal weight and see how good is estimated fetal weight in um, defining small fish gestational age, the detection rate was only about 65% for 10% false positive rate, which is consistent with the fact that actually the ultrasound scan is not very accurate um, near the end of the pregnancy, near term. When you look at actually the accuracy of estimated fetal weight for predicting small fish gestational age that have adverse outcomes, so that have neonatal morbidity or severe adverse outcomes like stillbirths or um, cerebral hypoxic ischemic encephalopsy, the detection rate was 36%. So it's so poor. So actually, estimated fetal weight on its own is very poor in, the, in identifying the pregnancies that have small babies with adverse outcomes. So. And the other thing is, well, if you look at the stillbirth cases, and again, this is our data, when we looked at about 200 stillbirth cases, and we exclude the one that have abnormalities or genetic syndromes or twins, and you look at the birth weight centile, about 50% of stillbirths, actually the birth weight is above the 10 centile. In fact, if you look at the stillbirths after 34 weeks, about two thirds of them are not small. Their birth weight centile is above the, above the 10 centile. And therefore, don't rely on fetal size alone to prevent stillbirths because particularly the stillbirths at the end of the pregnancy, like beyond 34 weeks, two thirds of them are not even small. And that's consistent with the data from King's from London, from the UK, where actually look at the birth weights and dials and each of these red dots is stillbirths. And where you see that that's um, stillbirths occurs before 32 weeks, yes, 70% of them were small, the majority of them were small, but actually after 32 weeks, only a third of stillbirth cases were actually small for gestation age, or the birth weight was less than 10 centile. It's exactly consistent with our data. So I'm just going to remind you again the changes that happen in fetal constriction. If you remember, the umbilical artery doppler, you start having um, increased pulse fertility index and absent the solid flow and hypoxia and reverse when it's acidosis. And the cerebral circulation, you have the opposite. So you have redistribution and therefore you have a low pulse fertility index. And therefore, what about if you combine these changes in the, in the form of a ratio, the cerebral placental ratio? 
which is a ratio between the middle severe artery phosphatality index to the umbilical artery phosphatality index. You remember, I showed you the inferior constriction, this is, will be lower, the PI of the middle severe artery and the umbilical artery will be higher. And therefore, in fetal constriction, the CPR is low. So why CPR? Why is it more important? Because when the studies compared it, compared it to the individual component of this ratio, whether the middle severe artery or the umbilical artery, the ratio, the CPR, was better predictor for adverse outcomes compared to its individual components or even the biophysical profile. So what we did a few years back in a large cohort, about 11 and a half thousand singleton pregnancies at term, we looked at the CPR and its relationship with, with birth weight. And of course, if the baby is small, birth weight less than 10 centile, they're more likely to have redistribution, they're more likely to have low CPR. And you see that in the red one, that the babies that have uh, birth weight less than 10 centile, about 17% of them had low CPR. But what was interesting for us is that also the babies who were not small, so their birth weight was above the 10 centile, a proportion of them also had redistribution. They had low CPR. And that made us question, are these babies actually gross restricted and showing redistribution? And therefore, we sort of constructed models that combine the fetal biometry or the size with the uh, Dopplers or the redistribution. And we looked at a number of outcomes, like the chance of intrapartum fetal uh, distress or neonatal mortality or neonatal morbidity or stillbirth. And what we found that this group in red, so the appropriate uh, for gestation age was low CPR, that they have high risk, almost the same as the one that small with redistribution of risk of intrapartum fetal compromise. And as we published a number of studies, about maybe seven or eight papers on the, uh, on the showing that some babies who are not small have redistribution as evidenced by, by low CPR, and these babies are at increased risk of a number of adverse outcomes. What about stillbirths? Well, we published this paper in the White Journal. Um, babies, also the pregnancies in the third trimester, if you combine the estimated fetal weight with the CPR, with the atrial Doppler, you can actually achieve a detection rate of about 70% for less than 10% false positive rate for stillbirths, and also similar about 80% for 14% false positive rate for perinatal deaths. And therefore, it's a concept that actually is not fetal size alone. You need to use other additional parameters like the doublers to help you identify the fetuses at risk. What about fetal gross velocity? And also, again, we publish on fetal gross velocity that correlates with this low CPR or redistribution and help you to identify the fetuses that, that have problem. And this is consistent with this Lancet paper. This is a POP study from Gordon Smith from Cambridge in the UK where um, again, they looked at um, in the leprous women, so first baby, trying to prospective study, screening study. And what they found that estimated fetal weight less than 10 centile in the third trimester on its own, yes, it would help you identifying small babies, but actually it's not a very good predictor of identifying the small babies that have adverse outcomes. And um, so while actually if you combine the baby that's small, with reduction in gross velocity, so abdominal circumference velocity in the lowest of the size, so that's impaired gross velocity, that actually it helps you identify small fish stations with neonatal morbidity, and the relative risk was 17.6, almost 18 times more likely to have this baby having adverse outcomes. And this is the data I'm going to show you. So this is estimated fetal weight less than 10 centile. And if you see any neonatal morbidity, metabolic acidosis, small fish gestation age, plus any neonatal morbidity, the last column on the right-hand side. And if you look at the estimated fetal weight plus the reduction in gross velocity, 18 times more likely to have small baby with neonatal morbidity. And therefore, as I mentioned, look at additional parameters like the doublers, the gross velocity, they help you identify the fetuses that are actually truly gross restricted and at risk rather than just small for gestation age. The last section of my talk is on twins, about fetal gross restriction in twin pregnancies. Well, how do we monitor for fetal gross restriction in twin pregnancies? And this was the ISWA guideline that we wrote a few years back, back in 2015-16. And since that, this has been adopted in other guidelines like the NICE guidelines, FIGO, and so on. And this chart is useful to show you the frequency and what you should do when you monitor these pregnancies with ultrasound scans. So whether diachronic or monochronic, you do it in the first trimester at 11 to 14 weeks. Obviously, you do the dating of the pregnancy, the labeling, you determine the chronicity, you offer a screening for Down syndrome. 
and in diagram twin pregnancy, the next scan is a twin week anomaly scan. And then after that, every four weeks, every four weeks until the end of the pregnancy, because you're monitoring for growth restriction. In monocorrhine twin pregnancy, after the first trimester, from 16 weeks, every two weeks until the end of the pregnancy, because you're monitoring for twin to twin transfusion syndrome, as well as growth restriction. And the ISWAC document, we did suggest or we recommended to look at umbilical antidoppler. However, other guidelines like the American College, for example, do not necessarily recommend umbilical antidoppler because of absence of evidence of its value in twin pregnancies. So the NICE guideline did recommend that we have to estimate fetal weight um, and calculate the discordance between the babies. So from uh, 20 weeks, document that in the scan report and do not scan, the frequency should not exceed 28 days. And I show you in monocorrhine twins, it should be even more frequent every two weeks. And if you have discordance of 25% or more, that would be a threshold to, to refer to a medicine specialist or a medicine center for further monitoring and determining the timing of delivery. Well, the problem when we wrote the ISWA guidelines, a number of people, the letters, we wrote to the journals, mainly from the American colleagues, um, questioning the diagnostic criteria of fetal gross restriction in, in twin pregnancies. Because different studies use different things. So some studies will use one baby with less than, it's made fetal weight less than 10 centile. Some of them would take into account the discordance in the size as well. And therefore we um, did this Delphi, we sort of got experts to, to reach a consensus on what are the diagnostic criteria of fetal gross restriction. And similar to the consensus diagnostic criteria that I show you for fetal gross restriction, this one were for twin pregnancies. So either if the estimated fetal weight is less than third centile, that's enough to diagnose fetal gross restriction in, um, in twin pregnancies. But if you use a conventional cutoff of 10 centile, in this case, in addition to the 10 centile, you need to also include a discordance of 25% or more or abnormal umbilical antidoppler. And interestingly, since the publication of this Delphi a couple of years ago, again, almost most of the new studies on uh, growth in twin pregnancies using this diagnostic criteria for twins. Um, in monochorionic twin pregnancies, uh, you need to do the staging or the classification, the Gratacos classification, according to the pattern of the umbilical antidoppler in, in um, the smaller baby. So you have type 1, type 2, type 3, type 1, when you have positive endosolic flow in the umbilical artery, then to have very good prognosis with low risk of deterioration or demise of the smaller twin. Type two, when you have absent or reverse endosolic flow in the umbilical artery, worse prognosis, have high risk of progression, high risk of demise of the smaller baby. Type three, it's rare, have this characteristic pattern of intermittent, absent or reverse endosolic flow in the umbilical artery, and it tends to have unpredictable pattern with a risk of demise of the smaller baby. The problem in monocorrhine twin pregnancy is that if the smaller baby dies, there is about 30% chance that the other baby could die or have brain damage. And therefore the management is more complicated compared to diagram twin pregnancy. When we wrote the twin, there is what twin guidelines for when we wanted to write a recommendation on the management of selective fetal restriction, it was difficult because there were no randomized controlled trials. It was just observational studies, which are um, obviously biased. And therefore we um, agreed that in diacurrent twin pregnancy, you manage them as singletons and you monitor and decide to deliver um, largely sim similar to singleton. While in monocurrent twin pregnancy, it's um, tricky because of the consequences to the normal larger twin of the demise of the smaller twin. And therefore the options are either expect the management, monitor and deliver early after a course of steroids, or doing active fit intervention in the form of laser or uh, selective termination, usually using cord occlusion. So in diacurrent twin pregnancies, as I mentioned, the recommendation was manage them as singletons. However, um, you need to try to avoid the risk of iatrogenic prematurity to the larger twin. And therefore, we try before 30 weeks, we are extremely reluctant to deliver because of the consequences to the larger twin and particularly, obviously, the smaller baby, you know, you, the prognosis is, uh, is questionable at this early stage. And therefore, before 30 weeks, the general consensus is expect the management. After 30, we 30 weeks, we will deliver if you have reversed a wave in the ductus venosus from uh, 32 weeks, so be delivered from reverse endosolic from umbilical artery doubler 
34 weeks if you have absent in the stomach flow and the umbilical artery and beyond 34 weeks we think you have very low threshold for delivery even if you have just low pi in the middle sub artery doubler for the monocorrhinate in pregnancy, again, the data is limited. And as I said, the outcome depends on the classification, the Gratagos classification, and depending on what management. So we expect the management or laser or cord occlusion. And we tried to address that in this meta-analysis. as published in my journal again a, few, a couple of years ago. And we looked at a long list of outcomes, including the risk of stillbirth or neonatal mortality, neonatal morbidity, the survival, the neurological impairment. It's a very long list. And because of the time, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to show you some of the key outcomes just to show you, make a, a point. So if you look at the endotrantomize, and you look at the different types, type 1, type 2, type 3, and look at the outcomes according to the management. So black is expected management, the blue is the laser, the red is the cord occlusion. And what you see from this figure, it clearly type 1, tend to have a low, very low risk of endotrine demise, even with expected management. And therefore, you don't really need to do any intervention in type 1 usually. If anything, the laser was associated with worse outcome, higher risk of endotrine demise. The other thing in type 2 and type 3, you see that actually laser, the blue, is have higher risk of endotrine demise compared to expected management, the black, or the cord occlusion in red. But you have to acknowledge that by definition, when you do cord occlusion, there's only one baby left. And the neonatal morbidity, interestingly, you see the opposite. So if you see type 2 and type 3 and you see the laser, it's actually with lower risk of neonatal morbidity compared to expected management or cord occlusion. And therefore, our conclusion in this meta-analysis is that type 1 have good outcomes generally and should be managed expectantly, type 2 and type 3, Certainly from this data, laser seems to have higher mortality, but lower morbidity compared to expected management. And therefore, we should consider active fit intervention and gestations remote from neonatal viability. So maybe at a very early gestation where it's likely to be more severe, outcome may be likely to be worse. In this case, maybe you should consider active fetal intervention. But generally, the, really the management should be individualized, take into account the gestational age of diagnosis, how severe is the discordance, and the magnitude of or the severity of the Doppler uh, abnormalities. So back to the ISWA guideline on twin pregnancies, how should we follow up? This pregnancy was complicated with selective fetal constriction. Well, in dichoronic twins, we should at least every two weeks, maybe more, if you have abnormal Dopplers and monocoronic twin pregnancies, at least weekly, if not more, because of the consequences of the demise of the smaller baby on the larger twin. And, and therefore, uh, in monocoronic twin pregnancies, complicated by selective fetal constriction, certainly if you at a gestation after 26 weeks and you think there is a a uh, high chance of demise of the smaller twin, like reverse A wave in the doctor's phenosis. And so in this case, you should consider delivery after a course of steroids. But if it's before 26 weeks, when the outcome is likely to be very guarded, in this case, you should consider the option of active fetal intervention. But generally speaking, type 1 tend to deliver between 34 and 36 weeks, while type 2 and type 3 uh, we try uh, certainly maximum 32 weeks, but if there are signs of deterioration, we might have to deliver earlier than that. So really my take home messages is that reduction of fetal restriction is less accurate than for preeclampsia, but look at the studies whether the outcome is small for gestational age of fetal restriction. The prevention of fetal restriction, uh, low-dose aspirin, despite the fact that it was shown to be potentially beneficial in systematic review, um, actually, in a randomized control trial, the ASPIR trial wasn't uh, useful. Um, the therapy, there is no, so far, there's no therapeutic options for early onset fetal constriction. So please do not use sildenafil or Viagra because it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be effective and potentially could be harmful. When you decide on the time of delivery, you need to take into account a number of things. Uh, very importantly, the gestational age, the fetal Doppler, and if you have, if you work in a place where you have computerized CTG, very useful. And diagonal twins, you need to monitor for fetal growth restriction by doing ultrasound scan every four weeks after 20 weeks, and monocoronary twins every two weeks from 16 weeks. 
And certainly, if you have a selective fetal obstruction in a diagrammatic twins, avoid delivery. Do your best to avoid delivery before 30 weeks. To avoid the risk of iatrogenic prematurity to the larger twin. While in monocorinic twins, the management varies according to the Atacos classification. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Well, that was absolutely brilliant. And we've heard so much on the internet and in our web meetings in the last few months. A lot of us have been in a state of confusion and I'm so glad you made it so straight, so simple and so straightforward. Uh, thanks. And if I may have the permission of our chairpersons, Dr. Dibyendu and Dr. Pratap, to go ahead with the question and answer session. Please, please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Please Thank go. you. Uh, the first is a clinical question. If I have a diagnosis of an early onset growth restriction at, say, 27 weeks, can I use low-dose aspirin? And if I made the same diagnosis at 32 weeks and three days, should I use low-dose aspirin? Okay, sorry. Can I just double check? So, you, the, the, what was the gestation? The, the first one. The first one is twenty-seven weeks. The diagnosis yeah. of early onset uh, growth yeah. restriction, and yeah. second, thirty-two and a half weeks. Yeah. Well, there's no data to suggest that or support giving aspirin at this stage. Yes. Um, I mean, yes, I said like there is some meta-analysis suggests that maybe giving aspirin in the first trimester might be useful, and certainly in this this woman for the next pregnancy maybe it's okay to give aspirin from the first trimester, but by giving aspirin at 32 weeks or 27 weeks, there's no benefit, that, 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 there's no evidence that it benefits at all. It's unlikely to improve the cross restriction. Thank you. And the second question is based on something we face in our practice every day. I see a pregnancy that's not corresponding to dates. I don't have a reliable dating scan. I don't have a reliable aneuploidy screen. And this patient has some awful ultrasound images, and I'm supposed to give a diagnosis and a surveillance plan and a prognosis. So if I discovered this at 33 weeks and my fundal height was 28, what should I do? And how much can I cover up in this one single scan? I think it's really tricky. It's really tricky, especially women, obviously now, you know, there's increased obesity worldwide. And therefore that affects the quality of the scan and advanced gestation is difficult to to really check all the anatomy and rule out all the abnormalities. Um, I mean, I think in the UK, we're relatively lucky because you have the option of uh, um, non-invasive testing, prenatal testing, for example, like or NIBT or cell-free DNA. So that can allow you, but it's expensive and it's not really available in, in all hospitals or all settings, particularly in uh, middle and low income countries. But you could, you could potentially do amniocentesis and test for the chromosomes if you're really worried about the possibility of aneuploidy, for example. And you cannot rule out, you know, that's an option if, if the woman is willing to. But also, I guess you need to have a discussion what you're going to do at 33 weeks or 28 weeks if the baby has an abnormality. You know, would this woman consider doing something about the pregnancy or not? I mean, this is a discussion that needs to take place. So, so how, you do, how you actually determine the gestation, probably I think you can use the headset conference, but you need to probably to bring her back into weeks to see whether that's actually was a correct. So, so for example, if you use a headset conference and then you bring her back into weeks and you see that actually the baby is not growing, in this case, that's likely to be actually cross restriction. Yeah, compared mm -hmm. to if it's just growing on the same line mm -hmm. on the chart, but maybe it was a bit early or maybe the dating was wrong. I think a clue to tell you whether it's gross restriction or not is to look at amniotic fluid, which is often easy to look at, even if it's a woman that's difficult to scan. The Dobblers, I find it again, even if a woman that's you know obese or sort of difficult to scan, you know, you would be able to know the umbilical artery Doppler is abnormal or not, the middle of artery is abnormal or not, the uterine to Doppler is abnormal or not. And if you see abnormalities that's more consistent of placenta insufficiency and gross restriction. And maybe you should monitor closely and, and decide on the ideal time of delivery, depending on the, like, like in the data and the guidance that I showed you earlier. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. Uh, there is one very specific question. And uh, that is the role of the aortic isthmus evaluation in growth restriction. We love doing the aortic isthmus in India. Yes, I, I, I knew that. I learned that when we had the Scan Academy a few weeks ago. And um, 
we, we had this discussion and debate about the use of uh, aortic isthmus versus ductus venosus. And certainly in the UK, we do not do aortic isthmus. It's not included in any of our guidelines. Certainly the group in, uh, by Gratikos in Barcelona publish a lot on the value of aortic isthmus and fetus restriction, but we don't really use it. Uh, it's not included in any of the, uh, of the guidelines. So I personally don't have a lot of experience with it. Hmm. Well, the, the, the way we look at it in India is that, does it warn us in early growth restriction, for instance, before the ductus venosus goes terribly wrong, that an in utero transfer might be a good idea? Well, I think, it's, I think it's reasonable because I said like you have to adapt your practice and your guidelines or protocols depending on what you, where you work and what you have accessible. And, and you know, if your patient has to be transferred or moved from one city to another, well, maybe that's useful. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, I, think and, and, that don't, I don't think people should say, well, because this is what we do in the UK, this is the right way of doing it. I don't think this is right because, you know, we, we work because this is how the healthcare system is structured in this country. But if you work in a different country with a different healthcare system, you need to see what is right for you. Yes, um, which is what these war guidelines also say, that the recent guidelines say that we have to have our local um, consideration. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us to, to the next question. This is from Dr. Susila Vavilala. We live in a country where one out of four babies is growth restricted. So should we in the third trimester then do a first part of the question, routine ultrasound scan at 36, 37 weeks. Second, routine growth and Doppler at 30 weeks. Um, well, I am I'm a fetal medicine specialist. So I, of course we're biased towards ultrasound scans. Um, yeah. And yes, if, if it was me and I'm pregnant, yes, I would want to have a scan at 36 weeks. And yes, probably I'd also want to have a scan at 32 weeks. Um, it all depends really whether you can afford it or not. Um, and certainly I said that in the UK, it's quite unique in a way that um, we have a national health system, it's free taxpayer money. And also, um, and therefore, you know, the guidance or sort of the national recommendations takes into account you know, is it really is it really sort of useful, essential, effective, cost-effective to take into account the money as well before they recommend it to everyone? And because we don't have this data at the moment, it's not routinely recommended in the UK. But that does not necessarily mean that I agree with it or the fact that that should be the practice in other countries where cost-effectiveness is not an issue because the patient is often paying for it. It's a private practice, for example. In this case, yes, I would do a routine scan at 32 and 36. Yes, and um, which, is, which is what we've started following recently because it truly helps us to stratify our patients. It also helps us to stratify what kind of expertise these patients should be getting. So if we don't have the necessary obstetric expertise or the nursery care, then we could just transfer the patient appropriately. And yeah. then you don't want to transfer the patient too early so you'd like to send them just about the right time so they don't waste money in another city, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. Also, bring you to the next question. In the absence of experience, you think we should go by the ultrasound staging of growth restriction um, a la Gratikos, um, or sh because, you know, you have an app and we have figures and it tells me what to do next. You see, uh, the Barcelona group have a, have a smartphone app where yeah. we put the weight we put in yeah. our um, gestational age calculation and we put in our Doppler and it tells us what to do next. Yeah. Uh, do, you, which, do you like that? Do you find it useful? When you don't have somebody sitting on your head to keep guiding you and taking responsibility. Um, how, what do you think of, of the ultrasound based uh, uh, staging and management of growth restriction? I mean, look, I think it's really useful. It's really useful, but I think I bet you it would be largely used by you know, maybe people who are not very experienced fetal medicine yes. or yeah. specialists, because I suspect the fetal medicine experts, because they have a lot of experience, they would fine tune the management compared to just the, the app tells you what to do. I think it's useful for, you know, a sort of general obstetricians or, you know, the young, maybe the young doctors where they just want to say, well, you know, one plus two plus three equal this, and therefore the app or the algorithm tells me what I should do. I think that's reasonable, and I think that's, I'm sure it's a good tool, but I think for really fetal medicine experts, I, I don't see them using it, because I think they will have their expertise uh, 
um, and therefore they tend to individualize the management. I'm sure they will be along the same lines, um, yeah, we have but, a lot but of, I think uh, it's different. Low and medium level expertise in, yeah. in, in clinical experience, and we have a lot of expertise in ultrasound. Yeah. Uh, because that's uh, a, the skewed way of training that we have uh, currently available in our part of the world. And so we've actually started using that a lot. And then. So do you use it, Ashok? Sorry? You use it yourself. Oh, I just use it all the time because I get patients from some uh, strange parts of the country where there is no expertise available. And okay. then we just happily say, okay, we will stage it and then we will give a plan of management based on that. So uh, we, we continuously use it. We also propagate the use of, of this staging because it really helps us to stratify in terms of risk uh, in the next few weeks. We really want to know when is my trouble going to start happening ahead and therefore should I start doing things. So in, in also in cases of when do I repeat my corticosteroids, we're terrified of steroids. And so do I need to repeat them because my last dose was at 32 and we've dragged her onto 35, for instance. So we yeah. use a lot for that as well. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think, again, sort of, I guess for the steroids, it depends also where you work and you're an neurologist. Um, certainly in the UK, we're very, we moved away from giving sort of multiple doses of steroids. So there is maybe a room for giving a second dose of steroids if the woman is still need to be delivered early and the interval since the last course of steroids be more than two weeks. That's sort of general a consensus, but it's not evidence-based. Yes, and then there, there are three or four questions that are related to what you emphasized already. And that is that in the average for gestational age fetus, if we do find alterations in the cerebral percentile ratio, that is not something to be neglected and we need to follow this up. One, that we need to reconfirm the finding after a few hours perhaps, or after a few minutes. And then of course, make sure that we do transfer them into a high uh, level of surveillance. Uh, yeah. Would you like to reiterate that message? That yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we you know we published loads of papers on CPR, and certainly I would say one very important variable or one important thing is to make sure that the measurement is accurate. Because sometimes if the baby is active and moving, you might have low MCAPI. So as Ashok said, if you have that, maybe just wait for a bit. You know, send the patient for a walk or something and repeat it to confirm that it's actually persistently abnormal. It's not just one off um, influenced by fetal activity or so. And if it is persistently abnormal, not to ignore it, um, but maybe to monitor closely, but also if you have just low MCAPI or low CPR at 32 weeks, that's not an indication to deliver because obviously the risk of prematurity, that may be indication to monitor closely. Thank you. And then there is one question on the role of umbilical vein flow and its ratio with the abdominal circumference. And um, how is that done and how do we use it? Um, it's not really part of routine clinical practice. Certainly some studies have um, looked at the umbilical uh, vein um, uh, as a prognostic val variable or prognostic Doppler uh, parameter, but it's not, uh, I wouldn't say it's, its value is very, important or superior to what we're using at the moment. And therefore it's not part of the routine uh, protocols. We also have um, um, a very short supply. And we've only just started a supply of computerized CTG availability. We truly have only three or four installations in the country so far, because we only now got an agent and we got clearance. Uh, the drug controller actually controls these, uh, this equipment. Um, in the absence of a computerized CTG, what is a good approach? I think um, it's a very good point because the, yes, you're right, computerized CTG is not available in every, everywhere. We have it and we use it, but in, in the absence of it, I would rely on the Dopplers, particularly the doctors who know the Doppler, especially in early onset fetal construction. And what about uh, relying on just a good old fashioned CTG and a biophysical profile? There's some of us who like to throw that in sometimes. And I don't think it's very relevant anymore. Yeah, but the biophysical profile, I mean, despite the fact it's not very commonly used in the UK, I think to some extent what we're doing on ultrasound scan is a form of biophysical profile. You're looking at the baby's movements, you're looking at amniotic fluid, you're looking at, uh, you know, and therefore it is a form of biophysical profile and certain countries like the, in the States, it's, it's part of the routine practice. 
So I think, I don't think we should throw away the CTG completely or biophysical profile. I think they have, they have a role, especially if you, are, if, you are, if you work in a place where you don't have access to computer or CTG, and let's say you can't do ductal stenosis and you can't get the woman to be seen by someone who can do ductal stenosis Doppler, I guess you have to use the best tools that you have. Wonderful. That actually uh, completes our time and our questions. And I want to thank you for putting this forward so lucidly, so clearly, and answering those questions so patiently. Thank, thank you. you. So much.